welcome. So today I'm going to do something a little different, and I'd like to do this, this kind of thing uh, ongoing in, in the future. I'm going to focus on a particular type of illusion. You know, when I started in magic, if you go all the way back, you know, hearing the stories about Blackstone growing up and then seeing Goebel when I was uh, when I was in Cub Scout and then later at 11 years old seeing his full illusion show, that was the impression that I had of, of magic. I, I did not see a close-up magician. I did not see a card magician. I did not see a coin manipulator. And I certainly did not see a mentalist. <clears throat> so the impression that I had of magic was grand illusion. And when I, uh, when I first aspired to be a magician, it was grand illusion that I wanted to do. And then Doug Henning came onto the scene and he totally changed the look of magic. I mean, up until Doug Henning's time, magicians wore top hats, they wore tuxedos with tails. George Goebel, in particular, wanted to have that, that uh, image as, as an illusionist, as a magician. And so he wore a goatee, his hair was slicked back, he wore the tuxedo, the tails, the whole thing. <clears throat> so that was what George Goebel, that was the impression that he had of a magician. He wanted to convey that to his audience. And I think since Alexander Herman in the 19th century, magicians have dressed that way up until Doug Henning. Doug Henning changed all of that. Doug Henning was the, was the hippie magician. And uh, I, I, I adored Doug Henning. But Doug Henning was a grand illusionist. He did, he did suspensions and levitations and he caused people to disappear and he did sawing and half illusions. He was a grand illusionist. And then on the, onto the scene comes David Copperfield, who I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that he, was, he is probably the greatest illusionist, not only of our time, but of all time. I'll probably say that a number of times. And, and, and that certainly is in the eye of the beholder, and it's certainly a subject to dispute. But, but I want to talk a little bit about David Copperfield today and his contributions to, to uh, magic, in particular to... A, a one illusion specifically. And uh, I think if you take a look at the links that I'm going to provide below, I think you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. David Copperfield takes an illusion that everyone else is doing and he brings something different, special to the table so that it looks like something entirely new. <clears throat> and he does it over and over and over again with every, every type of illusion you can imagine. So today, I want to focus on suspensions and levitations. In my opinion, the, the levitation is the signature effect. I always wanted to do a full body levitation. I never did. I did a broom suspension. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my broom suspension in a few minutes. I also did a chair suspension. Uh, now, now, if you're talking about close-up magicians, for years, close-up magicians have been levitating dollar bills. They've been levitating corks. They've been levitating uh, coins. You name it, they levitate it. And that's great. But there's nothing like sitting in an audience, in a theater, and seeing a human body rise up and float. That, that is, to me, that is magic, okay? <clears throat> and, and that's what I always aspired to do. And uh, I can tell you that from an operational, practical point of view. You know, I, I never was, I never was performing on a high level. I never was going into theaters that had union contracts, and so you had union guys on the lights and union guys on the sound and union people running the stage. Never did that. Uh, my, my shows were always, uh, I rented a truck, I loaded the truck, I drove the truck to the theater, I unloaded the truck, I set up my sets, I set up my lights, I set up my sound, and I ran the whole thing. That's what I was used to doing. And the thing about suspensions and levitations, on, on a high level, when, when you're floating a human being, heavy, it's heavy stuff, and, and it's expensive equipment. And so from a, from a practical point of view, you tend to shy away from that stuff. Um, and that's a shame. Now, now Denny Haney, my, my mentor and friend, 
uh, used to do the three sword suspension. Doug Henning did a version of that. Uh, Mark Wilson did a version of that. Uh, I did a broom suspension. The, the advantage of these things is uh, a suspension like that can be done fully surrounded. So it doesn't make any difference what situation you find yourself in. You can do your suspension. And so a lot of uh, practical performers uh, favor the broom suspension. Um, the pen dragons, while they did, in my opinion, at the time, and we're talking about the mid 80s, early 80s maybe, at the time, their levitation was the best levitation ever at the time. And I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. But when they went on tour, when they, when they traveled to do a show, very often they were doing a broom suspension. And the broom suspension they did, just like the sub trunk they did, just like the sword basket they did, was a cut above everyone else's. <clears throat> the Pendragon, if you want to study illusion, grand illusion, uh, the Pendragons have a series of DVDs out uh, featuring their thought process in developing the illusions and the presentations that they did. Now, they always stuck to pretty standard illusions. They did the, the sub trunk, they did the uh, sword basket, they did the suspension and levitation. They stuck to pretty standard stuff, but they developed it. And that, that's, what, that's what we all need to do. Whether we're mentalists or we're birthday performers or we're corporate performers, we need to take standard routines and develop them such that they become our signature routines. This is what the Pendragons did. So today I want to focus on levitation suspension specifically. This photograph right here is David Devant levitating, levitating a, a woman. Probably it's either St. George's Hall or it's the Egyptian Hall because that's where David Devant and the Masculines performed. But look at that. We're talking about before the turn of the century. We're talking about the 19th century here. <clears throat> the late, probably the 1800s or, or the, um, the 1890s maybe, or the 1880s, in around this period, uh, he's doing this levitation. You know, one of the things that is so appealing to me in the levitation, and it really comes through in this image, is the relationship of a man to a woman and a woman to a man. Um, there's just something romantic about it. That, you know, the magician stands there and, and the woman floats and then he passes a hoop over her. And, uh, and, and the thing I like about this image is She's on her side. She's not on her back. A lot of levitations, she's like she's hypnotized. She's unconscious. She levitates up. She levitates down. The magician snaps his hands and she stands up. Look at her. She's laying on her side. She, she, her head's resting on her hand. She's smiling at you. Uh, there's a relationship here. I always felt in, in my own work, when I, when I was working with a partner, it wasn't so much magician and assistant, it was magician and partner. And there's a relationship there that needs to be developed. The, 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 I, I, the, I never did, and, and the Pendragons did this, Charlotte and Jonathan. Uh, they had a relationship on and off stage. And it came through on stage. <clears throat> and I really feel that, that the, the levitation lends itself to that sort of thing. There has to be a relationship. I think it's better. It's enhanced when there's a relationship. It's just not a body. I mean, you could levitate anything, right? You could levitate a car. But you don't. You, but the reason you levitate a human being, uh, th there has to be something in that relationship that, that, it, that is conveyed. And I think this, this image does that. So the Masculines and David Devant were really, in my opinion, the first to develop this type of levitation. <clears throat> now, I'm going to get back to that in a second. This here is a drawing of, well, arguably the first suspension. Now, let me just uh, make, make some definitions here. When I say suspension, uh, I, I mean specifically floating on air, but not moving up and down. When I say levitation, I mean it moves, okay? I, I know that might be an arbitrary uh, distinction, but this would be a suspension. This person is suspended in midair as opposed to levitating through midair. 
but this uh, allegedly this happened in around the period of 1832 so it was long before this period this was the 1880s 1890s this was 1832 and uh, apparently this this occurred in India it was seen it was observed and it became the inspiration of Robert Houdin or perhaps some other people that were developing magic in around this period to develop uh, a more sophisticated type of suspension. This right here is a drawing of the Robert Houdin version known as the ethereal suspension. This was performed in 1849, uh, known as the ethereal suspension. Robert Houdin administered ether to an assistant who was then shown to to float horizontally. Now my understanding, again, I'm reading descriptions, so I didn't see this done. But my understanding was that rather than lift the person the way the way that the broom suspension is done today, my understanding is that Robert Houdin simply caused the person to 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 come to a horizontal position on their own. Now that would be more of a, a levitation because of the movement, you see. Uh, if, it, if it indeed occurred that way, I'm not sure that it did. But the mechanics of this particular effect, whether or not it was invented by Robert Houdin, that's, that's under some debate. Uh, it is attributable to Robert Houdin, even if it wasn't specifically developed by him. <clears throat> but the principle at work here in this suspension is the same principle that's at work in what's called the aerial or broom suspension, which I performed. And also the uh, sword suspension, which Doug Henning performed, De Denny Haney performed, and Mark Wilson performed. Another, another comment I want to make about Robert Houdin. He didn't actually administer ether to his assistant. But at the time, in the culture of the time, there was a lot of talk about the properties of ether. Now, now the reason why this is significant, as we develop our effects... As we develop our illusions, our presentations, we should think a little bit about the culture, the application. That's what's going on here. Magic that is tied to our culture and to things that are happening around us in our culture is much more significant, has much more meaning. Uh, and th this is something that I think a lot of magicians struggle with making their magic meaningful. Not everybody is, is as in love with the art as I am, or maybe you are. I mean, you're watching this channel, you're probably in love with magic, and God bless you for it. I'm glad that you are, and I am too. And I'll go to see a magic show regardless. But a lay audience that, that is not infatuated with magic, there should be some tie, tie into their culture that gives, that gives the magic purpose and meaning. And this is what Robert Houdin was so good at doing. And, uh, and this is why he used, I mean, ether is just a presentation. It's, it's not part of the effect. He said it was. Everybody thinks, oh, it's, it's because he administered ether. That's why he's able to, to become lighter than air. That, that's an explanation. It's not an effect. Uh, so so he, he didn't administer ether, but that's, that was the way he presented it. And it was plausible to his audience. Uh, so let, let me, uh, I didn't bring a picture of a sword suspension, but let me, let me just pause for a second here and speak a little bit about the, the, uh, actually the broom suspension. This is, this is the, the predecessor of the broom suspension. <coughs> a lot of magicians do the broom suspension today, and I know it's a very popular effect. And when I was considering getting into a suspension or levitation, Denny, of course, advised me, and he said, you know, you, you can go one of two ways. You can go with a sword suspension. That's the sword suspension right here. Doug Henning's performing it. Or you can go with a broom suspension, something like this. Well, I, I was thinking, how am I going to present this? And, and the, uh, the presentation I came up with, again, I, I love the relationship aspect. So my partner at the time, Jill Kennard, uh, had the costume that I had for her for this particular effect. And by the way, uh, it helps if you design 
if you if you fully costume all of your effects so that so that the things that you're wearing and the set design enhances the presentation. And so in this particular presentation, we were doing uh, Jill wore bib overalls and a flannel shirt, and she, uh, she was cleaning up backstage is what she was doing. She was kind of a backstage uh, assistant. And, uh, and I, I was sitting on the side and I was kind of watching her and watching her clean and and I came over and uh, and we did the broom suspension and it, it was a, it was an adorable little presentation. The first time we did it, let, let me let me tell you this because I, I think you'll find it amusing. Uh, my wife, when, when we watched this back on video, and and I cannot find the video, and I'm not sure that I'd posted it even if I could because, you know, the first time you do a trick. So <coughs> anyway, I I buy this thing from Denny Haney. And I get it home, and uh, my basement, we're living at Stoneway Place at the time, so it's a townhome. The basement is finished, and so it's a, it's a carpeted uh, surface downstairs in the basement where Jill and I are rehearsing. So I get Jill, and we, we, we go through this thing, uh, hunt, you know, hundreds of times so that it's, it's nice and clean, and it's we, we know the routine, we know the effect, we know what can go wrong and what can go right. Uh, I, I've learned it thoroughly. So now it's showtime, and, and it's, it's the first time I'm going to perform this thing for a live audience, and I'm on a stage. I'm on a full stage, which is which is gorgeous. We have we have a curtain that opens and closes. Uh, we have we have full stage. We have backstage wing areas. A uh, great great performance environment, and I've been on the stage many times, uh, but I was I was wearing a tuxedo and I was wearing you know nice nice shoes and. Uh, and uh, the way we blocked it, I, I, I really, to this day, I don't know how this happened. Uh, there were two, two really big mistakes that occurred on this particular show. And, of course, we, uh, we played the video back, we watched it, and we learned from our mistakes, and we never, we never committed these mistakes again. Ooh, it's embarrassing even to talk about, even, even now. But, um, so, <laughs> we set this thing up, and... The first thing that happens, uh, uh, in, in our version of the broom suspension, Jill uh, is standing with brooms under each arm. And she's standing on a stool. Okay? So, I remove one of the brooms so that she's just standing with one broom and a stool. Then I remove the stool. Now she's standing suspended from a single broom under her arm. At this point, I lift her horizontally. And then, you know, I, I go out to her, her legs, out to her feet, and then just let go. Well, as I'm lifting her, the surface, the floor that I'm performing on is rather slick. It maybe had just been polished. I don't know. It was slick. So I'm trying to lift her, and I'm sliding. And I almost dropped her. So, you can see this in the video. It, it's like being on ice skates. <laughs> if you can rehearse on the stage and in the environment in which you have to perform, that's best. Uh, but we didn't. And so, here I'm on this, this slick stage. I'm sliding across the stage. I can't really get leverage. I don't remember how I worked the problem out, but I did. I, got, I finally got leverage. And I lifted her, and we, we performed the illusion, and I, I got her back down, I put the broom under her arm, put the stool under her feet. Okay, now, we're in center stage. Now, we, we had blocked this thing carefully. So again, I, I don't know how this happened, but um, Jill finds herself needing to go in one direction that we didn't rehearse. And uh, she knew that if she walked directly, it would expose some of the some of the apparatus that makes the illusion work. So she didn't want to do that. She had the wherewithal to know <coughs> that if she walked in this direction, it would expose the uh, it would it would be an exposure which is horrendous. So instead, she walks backwards. She walks backwards, and so you know we're playing this video back and. We're watching me slip and slide and trying to lift her. And then we're watching her walk backwards to get off the stage. 
<laughs> oh man. So that, <laughs> that was my first experience with the broom suspension. Now I, I performed that illusion many times after that, never had another problem, never. I knew that I could be on a slick surface. I prepared for that. Uh, we knew what we had to do to get on and off the stage with the apparatus, so we prepared, pre pre prepared for that as well. We never had another moment's problem with the, with the effect, but uh, I share that with you just, just to say, hey folks, that's, that's magic in the big city, right? I mean, uh, if you're going to do grand illusions, see, the thing is, you can practice card tricks. You can. You can get your buddies together and you can show them card tricks. You can practice coin magic. You can practice even mentalism. But when you're doing grand illusion, you can get together with your crew and with your with your assistant, and you can work that thing till kingdom come. But when you get out in a stage, when you get out in a performance environment, you're going to encounter things that you didn't encounter in rehearsal. And so live and learn, right? So um, anyway, that that was my experience with a broom suspension. Now this is Doug Henning performing the sword suspension. The way this is typically done, <coughs> you have, uh, it requires, by the way, the broom suspension can be done with two people. It's easy to do with two people, and this was one of the reasons why I went with a broom suspension and not with the three sword suspension. I think the three sword suspension is a more elegant, uh, prettier, uh, I like it better. I really do. Uh, and look at Doug doing that. I mean, it's just just fantastic. Um, but you really, you really need to have three people to do this thing. Uh, so what generally happens is the person being suspended is standing there. She's put under some kind of a trance, or maybe not. But there's someone standing behind her, someone at her feet. She's lifted. She's lifted and balanced on the tip of three swords, thus the three sword suspension. And then the sword that is more or less at her rear end or perhaps a little bit higher, that sword is removed. Then there's a sword that's sort of in her spine, that sword is removed so that she is more or less suspended on the tip of one sword, which is pretty much at her neck. So, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's an elegant thing. It's beautiful. I've seen Mark Wilson do it. I've seen Doug Henning do it. I've seen Denny Haney do it. I love it. Uh, but, again, it, it kind of grew out of uh, Robert Houdin's uh, ethereal suspension. But uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I just love it. Okay, so let's get back to levitation. Levitation. This is a magic poster for Keller. And uh, he, for years and years and years, he toured around uh, with a sensational illusion called the Levitation of Princess Karnak. Now, here you are. Let me, let me go back, back a few images here, okay? David Devant... Uh, the method that David Devant is using here is probably, maybe not, but probably the same method that Keller is using here. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a history on this. Now, the illustration is pretty accurate. Uh, this, this is, by the way, this is 1900. 1900. So you have, you have uh, David Devant and the Masculines at St. George's Hall in the Egyptian Hall in England performing this full body levitation. Now what, what's happening here is this, per, if you can imagine this for a moment, this person is either uh, reclining on a sofa or she's reclining on the floor of the stage. David Devant comes out and uh, some of this action and she rises. Okay, that is elegant, elegant. So she rises. And that's what's going on here, and that's what's going on here as well. Uh, Princess Karnak, she rose and rose, a full body levitation, never been seen before, 1900, absolutely stunning. Well, here's a little bit of the backstory. 
And if you, if you go back a couple of videos now to when I reviewed three videos, remember that? I did The Prestige, I did The, the Illusionist, I did Magicians. The Prestige is really about the kind of rivalry that occurs between magicians. Well, The Levitation of Princess Karnak, even though he advertised it as his own, certainly wasn't. It was invented by John Neville Maskelyne, and it was performed in England around the turn of the century. And, uh, and so Keller was over in England, and he's watching John Neville Maskelyne or David Devant perform this effect. And he goes backstage and he offers, he offers to purchase the illusion from the Masculines. And they said no. Now, you know, you, know, you have a couple of options here. When, when you go and you offer to buy an effect from a performer, and the performer says no, either you can go do another effect, or you can develop your own. You develop your own. You say to yourself, if, if I had to achieve that effect, how would I do it? How would I go about engineering that so that I can produce that? And what would I bring to it so that I can distinguish what I'm doing from what John Neville Musclean is already doing? That, I, I think that's what, that's what should be done. But more often than not, in the magic business, that is not what is done. Instead, <coughs> Keller hired one of Maskelyne's engineers, Paul Valadon. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Paul Valadon, V-A-L-A-D-O-N. So Keller hires Paul away from the Maskelynes, brings him back to the United States. Paul understands the intimate workings of this particular effect and they're able to reconstruct it in the United States and then Keller tours with it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about, about copyright infringement and uh, taking somebody else's work and so on and so on. This is the history of magic, man. This is the history of magic. It happens all the time. I can tell you it's happening today. Uh, a performer goes out, and uh, again, the big names in invention, you have Andre Cole, you have Jim Steinmeier, you have Johnny Gahn, uh, you have these guys that are inventing stuff, and, uh, and then there's, you know, almost immediately there's knockoffs out there. Um, and they're not paying these fees. I'm going to get into fees in a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what a proprietary illusion costs, and you might begin to understand, whoo-wee, you know, uh, when we talk about that, <coughs> but but that's what happened. Okay, that that's history, man. <coughs> so um, this became a signature effect for Keller, and then later he sold his illusion show to Th Howard Thurston, who also toured with uh, with the Levitation of Princess Karnak. So that's the Levitation of Princess Karnak. Now, this is a drawing. Uh, in the early part of the 19th century, so it wouldn't be too long after this you have what's called the Aga Levitation. I can tell you, I, I'm, again, I'm not going to disclose methods, but the methods are different. The effect is the same. The methods are different. In both illusions, the person, the, the, the female usually, the person lays down, the magician levitates her up. She goes up, up, she comes back down, okay? Up, down, that's what's going on here. I emphasize that because we're going to get some innovation a little ways down the road that is going to violate that that law. I mean, everybody everybody thought a, a, a levitation, she, she goes up, past the hoops, she comes down, end of story. You're about to see that that changed radically in, in our time. But here we are, uh, this is a different method invented by Albert Winkler, whose uh, stage name was Venturini. Venturini. Uh, he's a German performer, I believe, and he invented the Aga Levitation. <coughs> Aga Levitation is still popular today. This method is no longer used. I can tell you that. It's no longer used. At least to the best of my knowledge, it's no longer used. I mean, uh, there might be some variations of it. Uh, 
certainly innovations, hopefully, but oh boy, this, this was a, uh, a very involved method that took, uh, took some engineering to, to bring it off. This, this was simplicity compared to this. And so it was, it was a innovation at the time. And, uh, and, and I know that, that uh, these are still sold. Abbott, Mag Mag Abbott Magic sells them. Uh, they're still available. And uh, again, it's, it's a heavy prop and you need full stage setting to do it. But it's a great, it's still a great levitation. It truly is, Aga levitation. So from Aga, we go to Ajra. Ajra. Aga, you see the person laying there. They float up, they float down. End of story. Ajra was a special innovation. It, it was invented and first performed in 1914. The illusion is credited to Sir Leroy. <coughs> it was performed with his, uh, with his wife and assistant, uh, Talma. And I haven't done a video on Talma, but there is a blog entry on my website giving you the history of this fine performer. Uh, but she was the first to do the, the Ajra levitation with her husband, Sir Vane Leroy. London, 1914. This is the illusion that I saw George Goebel do that I think, I think the Ajra levitation is the illusion that captured me. That totally, that, that I saw it done and I said, I have got to be a magician. So this is it. This is it for me. Uh, basically what happens in the Ajra, and I, I love this illustration. It's probably the best illustration of Ajra I've ever seen because you have this, this ghost-like figure. And remember in 1914, uh, you know, there, were, there was a lot of belief in, in uh, spirit activity and so on. I'm, I'm not sure that Survey Leroy by any means uh, 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 performed it with that angle, but certainly the... the uh, the poster suggests that it's an ethereal form, uh, and, and it's it's out over the audience, which I don't think it happened. But but uh, you have a lot of flexibility with this particular uh, illusion. So I, I'm watching George Goebel do this, and a uh, person comes out. They lay on a sofa. They're covered. They're covered with a sheet, uh, something like this. They're covered, and then under cover, they begin to levitate. Now. Your first thought as a lay person is, well, if they're completely covered, there can't be wires, right? Because you can see the cover all around and, and the sheets laid over them. So, um, so that's, that's part of the process that goes on <coughs> in the minds of the spectators, I think. So she comes up, the, 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 the sofa is removed, she floats all the way up, hoops are passed around her, and at some point... That sheet is pulled away, and again, if, if I focus on what happens in the mind of the audience, I, I remember my own experience with this. Now, I know that I didn't actually see this happen, but in my imagination and in my mind, I thought I saw her vanish. I thought I, I saw her body for an instant before it vanished, and then she appears in the back of the audience and she runs forward. And that's the Ajra levitation, folks. Uh, it, it is still today, it is a wonderful illusion. George Goebel did it. Uh, very, very good. Now, uh, back to suspensions a little bit. This is the chair suspension. This was my first suspension. I did this before I did the broom suspension. One of the advantages of the chair suspension, allegedly, and let, let me speak to this, <coughs> is that you can use a member of the audience. Folks, let me, let me just stop right here. If you're doing a suspension levitation, something like this, do not use a member of the audience. Don't do it. Because you, you can't, it's not rehearsed, okay? A member of the audience is not rehearsed. Uh, they don't know what to expect. Uh, their, their behavior is going to be a little bit unpredictable. And what would happen? What would happen if she moved? If she sneezed? You know, I, I mean, you don't want to cause injury, so uh, so I don't I don't think it's a good idea. I, I don't. Now there are suspensions you might be able to do. I'm going to talk about one in a minute. The Walter Zaney Blaney suspension possibility, 
but a chair suspension, not on your life, not on your life. So I, I get this thing. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm believing that the chair suspension will allow me, this is before I met Jill, before, I, I mean, I've always known Jill, but it was before she worked with the show. So I'm thinking that the chair suspension will allow me to perform a suspension without having an assistant in the show. Incorrect. So I invest in this thing, and by the way, this is a Mac Magic version. Uh, I got it. You can get you get what you pay for, and I bought a very very good one uh, with a with a good weight capacity. And um, you know the thing is, if you buy a cheap one and you put somebody who weighs eighty pounds on a cheap one, you know, like this, right? You get a good one. You put somebody who weighs one hundred and fifty pounds on a good one, and it's nice and steady. Rock. So that, that's the difference in quality that's out there in terms of chair suspensions. <clears throat> this was invented in 1937 by a guy named Jack Hughes. There is some debate as to whether UF Grant improved it or invented it, and Jack Hughes in, improved it. I don't know. I don't know who invented it. It's attributable to Jack Hughes. Uh, it might have been UF Grant. I don't know. But I did it for a period of time. Uh, but So I get this thing, and I think that... Uh, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use a member of the audience, and, and in, in my rehearsal with it, I realized it was just too dangerous. I wasn't going to do it, so uh, I ended up using an assistant anyway. You know, here here I'm 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 not getting a broom suspension, and I'm not getting a three sword suspension, so that I can do this with a member of the audience, and I get it, and I can't. So uh, so I ended up using an assistant anyway, and that's when I just moved to the, the, the broom suspension. So that's the chair suspension, folks. Now this, <coughs> this right here, is the Walter Zaney Blaney suspension, sometimes called the ladder suspension. Uh, David Copperfield performed this in his China special. I'm going to put a link to it below. It is a wonderful performance. In the per so anyway, back to... Back to my original purpose was to talk about suspensions and levitations. This is a picture of Jonathan and Charlotte Pendragon in the late 1980s doing what came to be known as the 360 levitation. This was uh, an innovation that changed the way levitation is done. So if you want, if you want the real evolution here, you start with Princess Karnak. You start with John Neville Masclean at the Egyptian Hall or maybe St. George's Hall. You start here. Now you really didn't get innovation until you get to Jonathan and Charlotte. So this is 1900. This is the turn of the century to 1980. That's about 80 years, right? 80 years. So what Jonathan, I, I don't know that he invented it, it might have been Johnny Gone, I don't know who invented it. But it was the first time I ever saw well, maybe not okay, the first time I ever saw movement around the magician. It's not the first time a levitating body moved other than up and down, but it's the first time that I saw this, and again, going back to something I said earlier, there's a relationship here. I'm going to put the link, but here's, here's one of the problems with some of the links that I'm finding. I'm finding these illusions. I'm finding them on YouTube. The problem is the production, the, 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 the reproduction quality is so bad. Now, granted, these were made, the, these videos were made in the 80s, and we didn't have the same digital technology, but the broadcast quality just isn't there. So, so you, you can see the picture's terrible. So you have to watch something that's pretty grainy, but, but watch it. Watch it, because you really get to see the evolution of this effect. So Jonathan comes out. <coughs> Scarlet, Charlotte is laying on the platform. Jonathan steps up on the platform, and he does this kind of thing, and she floats up. Now, she's fully conscious, and she's fully interactive. So, you get a sense for the relationship and the romance that exists between these two performers during this effect. And so, I'm watching this, and, I, and I, I'm seeing it. It was, it was done on live television, 
And so I'm, I'm seeing this for the first time with everybody else, and she's floating up and thinking, oh, that's gorgeous. You know, it's a gorgeous levitation. And by itself, that it was, it was, it was magnificent. Then Charlotte bends her body and and almost swims in air around Jonathan, around him, 360 degrees around him. It blew everybody's mind. Everybody was talking about this after they did it. 360 degrees around the performance. Magnificent. Magnificent. So, uh, the Pendragons, folks. The Pendragons. I'm going to talk more about them uh, in, in future videos. Uh, if you want to study Grand Illusion, you must study Jonathan and Charlotte Pendragon. So, let's talk about David Copperfield, shall we? So, because I think that uh, the greatest levitations of our time have come from the performances of David Copperfield. So here we are in the mid-80s, it's around the same period as Jonathan and Charlotte, and uh, David Copperfield is doing a classic floating lady. He did do one innovation, I want to talk to you about that in a second, but I want to give you a little bit, I'm, I'm going to give you the links below so you can see this. Uh, again, it's poor quality. <clears throat> but uh, what he did here, as you can see by the picture, very classic. In, in David's earlier days, he had a, he had a real uh, dedication to a classic look. Uh, he was a contrast to Doug Henning, who was, who was uh, very hip and very, um, very uh, culture-specific. David Copperfield was more of a traditional illusionist when he started out. He changed, he evolved, but this is where he started. And uh, he opens the effect with the dancing cane. Now, David Copperfield is, uh, is noted for his dancing cane work, and he gets so much height on the dancing cane. Dancing cane, by the way, if you do not know, it's a cane, and uh, it, it floats between the hands and around the body. So it's a beautiful thing, and it's very easy to do. Uh, it's elegant to watch, and so David introduces the effect this way. He's doing dancing cane. He sets the cane down. He goes over, and once again, there's a relationship. She's standing, and he's hypnotizing her. He, he raises her hand and lowers it. You know, levitation. He raises the other hand and lowers it. He moves her head back and forth, and then he lays her down. And he levitates her, and she comes up, he passes the hoop. Now for the innovation, okay? The sofa that she was laying on, that she's no longer because she's floating in air, it's moved forward toward the audience. She travels from backstage all the way front stage back down into the sofa. Great, great. When I saw this, again, I'm watching this stuff. Uh, I don't think David Copperfield did live. I know Pendragons did, Doug Henning always did, but I'm seeing it with everybody else. I'm, you know, when it premiered on television, that's when I'm seeing it, and I was absolutely uh, stunned by this effect. So, a few years later, you can see the way David Copperfield has changed his presentation. Very classic. Uh, this, this is getting into a very thematic uh, driven uh, type of presentation. He's wearing a costume, she's wearing a costume. This had a uh, very jungle kind of feel, a very uh, um, visceral, and uh, it, it was exciting. And he, uh, he's, he's combining two illusions here. He's combining the Pendragon 360 with the fountain illusion, with the fountain levitation, which I haven't spoken of, about too much. It's it's, uh, it's a variation on a standard levitation, only you're using water. So, uh, in this levitation, uh, the female, the assistant, the partner, uh, goes around his body. And that's a beautiful thing to see. And the relate again, the relationship of the two performers in this effect is, is, uh, is what really captures my imagination and my fascination, and it's why I, I recommend it to you, and I'll put the links below so you can see that. Just, just elegant and gorgeous. So, this is literally the, the, the evolution of 
levitation, okay? You have the classic. The woman floats up, the woman floats down, basically. You have the 360, where she goes around the body, and uh, there's so much romance in that. And then, folks, this I believe this is the greatest illusion of all time. David Copperfield's flying illusion. He appears to fly on stage for several minutes while surrounded by audience members. During the effect, he floats up, he floats down, he floats back, he floats forth, he goes down into a crystal cabinet, he floats inside the crystal cabinet while people walk on top of it. Uh, it was invented by Johnny Gahn, who invents so much, he is such a brilliant uh, person. So, um, it's fully patented, <clears throat> but let, let, me, let me just, uh, let me stop for a second and, and try to give you a sense for what this was like. I remember, you know, there's certain things you remember. You, you remember when Cal Ripken uh, broke the record for consecutive games, you know, I remember where I was when that happened. I was in Ocean City watching the game with my family, and uh, it, it was quite a moment for us. And of course, I, I remember where I was when I saw this. I, I, was, uh, I was actually alone in the basement at 40 Stoneway Place. I was watching it on television. And I, I had an emotional experience. I did. And, and uh, when I saw him do it live, which was the same year, I went to see him when he came to Baltimore. And I had the same experience. And people that have gone to see him in Las Vegas, where he's performing now, have the same experience. David Copperfield... Has, has learned how to evoke an emotional response. Uh, he doesn't just do magic. He doesn't just do illusions. He, he evokes emotion. And so he comes out and he, he talks about flying in his dreams. Now, I have done that. I mean, I, have, I, I, I know what it's like to fly in a dream because I've done that. So when he began to talk about that and describe it, I, 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 I related deeply to it. So he, he lays on the middle, he's in the middle of a bear stage. He's, he's laying flat on the, on the ground on the stage. And he reaches up with his hands and he pushes and his body lifts. And then he's able to push against the air and literally fly. Folks, literally fly. Let, let, me, let me go back. That is the evolution of the levitation. You start here. She goes up, she goes down. Fantastic. Here. There are audience members up on stage, sitting on and the wings. There are hoops, big hoops. At one point, he flies over, gets an audience member, and lifts her off the ground. I mean, I, the whole thing is, uh, is an exercise in what magic is all about. It is, it is believing in the impossible. It is achieving the impossible. It's achieving beyond your wildest imagination. That's what magic is all about. That's what Grand Illusion is all about. And nobody, in my opinion, has done that better, has demonstrated that more effectively than David Copperfield. I, I don't think I'll ever see, I may, I hope, I do, but I don't think I will ever see an illusion that's greater than this one. Again, the, the, the levitation, the levitation is, uh, for me, for me, the world's greatest illusion. When I think magic, the first thing that comes to my mind is this. <clears throat> the levitation. <clears throat> Folks, I, I hope you've enjoyed this little journey down, uh, down memory lane here, uh, looking at some of these great, great uh, levitations through history. I hope you've enjoyed this little... And again, these are my opinions. I'm giving you my opinions. Uh, if, if you have a different uh, point of view, I'd like to hear about it. 
if you have a, if you have some access to history that I don't, if you think I've made a mistake in my chronology, if you think I've made a mistake somewhere along, please correct me. I, I really would like to get this right. You know, I, I, I present this to you. This is the best information that I have right now. Hopefully I acquire more information and, and, uh, and I learn a little bit more about this great effect. But I would invite you to comment. Please subscribe if you have not already done so. Let's talk about, let's have a dialogue about suspensions and levitations. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you next time.